Hello and uh, welcome to the last afternoon session on the first official day of Linux Conf AU. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to present our speaker today. Um, John Sullivan is here from the Freedom uh, Free Software Foundation. And I think we have all in this room probably understand and know who FSF is. If not, John will tell us a little bit about it um, and dive into his topic. Thank you, John. I don't think I'm last though, right? Fontaine, aren't you in here the last, after? The last session, so I yeah. was in two talks. Last two, oh, last, <laughs> right, last uh, thing uninterrupted by coffee. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. I know there's uh, multiple great talks happening in this time slot that I would like to be seeing, so I appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is John Sullivan. I've been at the Free Software Foundation since uh, 2003. Um, I've been the executive director there for the last seven years. And this is my first time in Australia and my first time at LCA. Uh, so it's been uh, really awesome. I've always observed this conference from afar and been jealous and wanted to find a year when I could finally come. Um, so this is wonderful. And also, it's, uh, it's really great to meet so many new people um, because I haven't been here before. And there's you know, such a great regular attendance at um, this event. It's, please feel free. I'll be here till Saturday. If anything that I talk about um, strikes your interest or you want to hear more about it or you have some ideas for us, uh, please don't hesitate to grab me during the coffee break and introduce yourself. I'd love to meet you. Uh, another fact about me is I'm a words person. Um, I went to school for writing, creative writing. That means there's way too many words on these slides. I'm aware of that. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you don't have to read them all. Who, uh, is everybody familiar with the Free Software Foundation? Raise your hand if you've heard of the FSF. Okay, fantastic. Um, a lot of people uh, at this point in the world doing free software or uh, open source software have not been alive have, uh, with, in a world without the FSF and without free software. We're now 30, uh, going into our, just turned 32 last October, um, 32 years of promoting computer user freedom and sponsoring the GNU project, which is a project to produce a fully free operating system. So. Before I dive into things here any further, I want to do a quick plug for another amazing conference that you might want to go to. That is Libra Planet. It's a conference that the FSF puts on every year in Cambridge in partnership with MIT. We just announced our keynote speakers, Gabriel McClellan, Deb Nicholson, Seth Schoen, and Richard Stallman. Uh, and we'll be putting the rest of the schedule up online at LibraPlanet.org in the next couple of weeks. It's March 24th and 25th. Not too late to get your plane tickets. Um, and we do do it every year, if, uh, and the CFP usually opens around November. Um, so if you would like to get a proposal in for next time around, that's when you should uh, start keeping an eye on things. And this conference and all the work that we do is geared towards our, our mission. And I, I like to put this at the beginning, even for people that are familiar with the FSF, um, because uh, it puts everything else in context. We're not just out here to promote free software as a, a good kind of software that we hope people will use more of. We're actually working to make sure that computer users can do everything that they want to do on any kind of computer using only free software. Um, so in our perfect world, that means there is no proprietary software. Uh, all software that users run on any computer, whether they're mobile device, you know, telephone, tablet, in their car, uh, all of that software should be freely uh, modifiable. They can inspect it. They can redistribute it. Um, those things should apply to all the software that they use. So it's not just about promoting free software as a, a better kind of software um, and helping interoperate with proprietary software that's out there. It's about, in the end, replacing everything that's proprietary. And I think this differentiates the FSF from a lot of other organizations working um, in this space. You know, a lot of uh, the people that we work with and who do great work uh, are just focused on things from a different angle. They're just trying to bring more free software on the world and, and help people see how good it is, but they're not as concerned um, as we are, or as focused as we are on uh, replacing all of the proprietary software. And so that's, you know, we're going to talk about freedom embedded today. And, and that's what I mean by that is to every place where we have software embedded, you know, we need the freedom uh, along with it. And I'm going to look at some of the ways where that's not currently happening. You know, why what we currently have is more like control embedded, surveillance embedded, restriction embedded, um, and all these places where we have software right now, and what we can do about changing that. And even though we're called the Free Software Foundation, we are concerned about user freedom. Uh, and user freedom can be affected by a lot of different things. Uh, it can be affected by um, the hardware that you're using. It can be 
uh, affected by you know, rules that are imposed on you about things you can do with any kind of object that's running software. Uh, we're one of the most important factors in user freedom, though, is the terms that govern the distribution of the software itself and the terms of use for the software itself. And that's what, what we focus on. We don't think that that's the entirety of the problem of protecting user freedom. We know that there's a lot of other kinds of work that need to be done in free hardware um, and other kinds of space in order to truly have people be empowered by the technology that they're using. But the software component of it is what we focus on. And we do think that it's one of the most important components out there. Uh, free software is defined by the four freedoms, which I think people here are, are generally familiar with. But just to go through them quickly, we have the freedom to run the program, freedom to study how the program works and change it, freedom to redistribute copies, freedom to redistribute modified uh, versions to others. So in order to be free software, and when I say that, I mean any software whose license terms allow all of these things. Uh, and there are, even though this is a familiar definition to many people in our community, there are many, there's a couple big misconceptions floating around that I like to address. I've been telling myself that as soon as I go a year without hearing any, either of them, I'll stop talking about it. But um, they have to do with the difference between free software and uh, open source and free software and commercial software. Um, so one thing I hear a lot is that free software is copyleft, like the GNU General Public License, and Open source is permissively licensed software like Apache or people call MIT or expat. Um, that's not true. What's open source is defined by the open source definition uh, maintained by the open source initiative. And what is free software uh, is what meets these uh, criteria here. If something meets these criteria here, it almost certainly also meets the open source definition and vice versa. Um, so when it comes to the actual software and talking about the licenses, um, there's very little difference. And it is not a difference between copyleft and permissive. And the second thing I hear, unfortunately, a lot is, is people contrasting free software with commercial software. Say, well, we can't put this under a free license. Uh, we need to distribute it under a commercial license. Uh, what people mean by commercial in that context is proprietary, uh, that it's software that, for example, you're not allowed to modify or redistribute. Um, but in fact, in order to be free software, you have to allow commercial use of the software. Uh, licenses which say you may not use the software for commercial applications, that's not free software. That's a restriction on freedom zero, uh, the freedom to run the program for any purpose. It's also a restriction on freedoms two and three to be able to share the program for any purpose, which includes commercial purposes. So now that we have those things out of the way, um, I try to correct it when I see it, and I hope you'll do the same thing because it's needless kind of confusion. So the subtitle of this talk is Devices That Respect Users and Their Communities. So it's not, uh, this means that we're not just talking about developers um, who need to have the freedom to change the software that they're using in their project. Um, we're talking about users and the impact that whether a program is proprietary or free has on their lives. And we know already that free software is not just for programmers because Android um, as of the first quarter in 2017, had 86% of the market share uh, in the smartphone space. It's the largest operating system, largest install base of any operating system of any kind. Uh, and it is, at its core, free software. So free software is being used by lots of people who, in fact, don't know that they're using free software. If you walk up to one of those uh, 2 billion users on the street and ask them, if the uh, software that they're using is free or proprietary, they probably will either guess proprietary or not understand what the question means. Um, but nonetheless, they're using it. However, at the same time, nearly all of these people are also using Google Play, which is a proprietary application to install other applications. Um, and they're also using probably lots of other proprietary software, since every Android device that you can actually purchase comes not only with the free Android base, but also with proprietary software uh, both for drivers to help to make Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, graphic acceleration work, and also to uh, like Google Play um, and other proprietary applications that the different distributors uh, slap on there. So that is what we call a screensaver. <laughs> um, so. Well, that means that when we're talking about free software uh, and devices that respect users and the communities, we are talking not about just the software itself, but we're talking about the 
the ideas behind it. Because we, here we have a situation where people are using free software to a large degree, but their freedoms uh, are not fully being respected because they're also using uh, a bunch of proprietary software. Bad things happen uh, when people are using proprietary software. And I'm going to go through a few examples of this, uh, just some of my favorites. This first one, um, people may have heard about when it happens, but in uh, 2009, Amazon remotely deleted copies of the book 1984 from people's Kindles. Does everybody know book 1984? Kind of about the type of world where some entity can arbitrarily uh, censor and, and delete uh, your culture, your expression, um, your political views. So, you know, I didn't, I wasn't exactly happy that that happens. I was working as a campaigns manager at the FSF at the time, and we were campaigning very hard against DRM and Amazon. And I was like, well, this is our opportunity, right? Like, they, they can't come back from this. They just uh, literally, while people slept in the middle of the night, deleted copies of a book um, from people's devices. And, and people did not even know that that was possible. Right? There was so much, like, surprise, a lot of outcry about this. It wasn't just the book that was deleted. It was also, you know, you can take notes on books. Um, on the Kindle, and some I read stories of students who had been reading the book on their Kindle for their school classes, and they had their notes. Those were gone too. And I thought, well, something has to happen about this. Something has to change. But uh, in fact, nothing changed. There was some outcry about it. Amazon said, after a while, said, uh, we're, we're sorry. Um, we had a legitimate reason to delete that book. It was a copyright violation. Um, because someone who did not have permission had uploaded the book to the Kindle store. And they said, we won't do that kind of thing again. But they didn't change anything. They still have the power to do that. Uh, and all the same, you know, the, same, the situation is still there. They didn't implement any new formal policy. It also was not the first time they'd done it, it turned out. They just had gotten away with it because it wasn't 1984. So, you know, think about what else could have happened here, right? Like, they, they could have, instead of just deleting the book, they could have just modified some words in it. They could have given you a new version of the book. Uh, and would you know? you know? Not unless the software told you or unless you had paid very close attention to the book and had read it many times. Uh, and this is why this is a particularly frightening example to me, even nine years later, is it's a, such an example of the way that as our culture becomes increasingly digital, uh, things can just be disappeared, modified um, through proprietary software on these devices. And we had another uh, frightening example not too long ago in the United States. Tesla makes electric cars, has uh, very, very computer-driven, a lot of software in those cars. During Hurricane Irma in the United States, uh, people needed to evacuate. Electric cars have limited range. Tesla magically, over the network, increased the range of the cars um, for people who had not paid the extra amounts to get the higher range originally. So Tesla was able to release uh, the battery controls on customers' vehicles remotely. This is a good thing, right? It's a hurricane. People need to get away. So it's better that they did this than not. But what does this show us about the kind of control that uh, companies have over us um, when things like cars uh, book readers have software built into them and a network connection, and we don't have access to that software. And again, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't cheering against this, um, but I was sort of curious what would have happened if Tesla hadn't done this, and um, some enterprising hacker had uh, figured out to do it to their own car in order to escape the hurricane. Would Tesla have uh, tried to prosecute them for a DMCA violation for circumventing their protection measures on the car in order to increase the range without paying for it? Uh, I would hope not, but um, they didn't have to do that. They took a proactive step. And what this amounts to is, 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 and this is why software, why the FSF works so hard to stop software from being the place where uh, rules are enforced on people because it's such a powerful form of control. So with access to the software in your car, Tesla was literally selling people the ability to get from one place to another in a car they'd already purchased and already own. Uh, and it's that kind of ongoing um, power that's so frightening and, and can lead to so many uh, scary consequences, even though in times like this, um, it was helpful. Only helpful because they didn't originally enable it. 
Likewise, uh, you know, we have freedom of movement, we have freedom of expression and reading. We also have uh, surveillance and privacy issues with proprietary software. So this comedian, Emo Phillips, uh, made a joke. He said, the other day, a woman came up to me and said, didn't I see you on television? I said, I don't know. You can't see out the other way. <laughs> well, turns out you can. <laughs> so Vizio, TV company, was busted by the uh, FTC in the United States for um, on a second-by-second -second basis, collecting pixels on the screen, matching those pixels to a database of TV uh, stuff to find out what you were watching, and then uh, sharing that information. So Vizio was watching you um, and was looking for ways to uh, monetize that information. So you know, this is basically just 100 billion reminders why you need to be completely in charge of the software on that big computer, which people call a TV. Um, sitting in your living room. And, well, why should you care about this? Who, who, who cares if, if they know what you're watching on television, what bad sitcom you like to watch reruns of? You, know, you have to think about the ways that data can be, can be used. Health insurance companies can use it to raise your rates. You're spending too much time watching the television. You're unhealthy. Uh, you're watching political um, documentaries. Uh, you're watching uh, things about the Free Software Foundation. Right? So it's, uh, it is something to be concerned about. Um, and we, uh, Software Freedom Conservancy, I wanna, I wanna highlight, did some great work in this area fighting for the rights of users to modify uh, the software on their televisions as part of a, a process that comes up every few years in the US for getting exceptions to the um, anti-circumvention rules of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, but we, it's work that we keep having to repeat um, every few years, and it's really just a minimal uh, ability for users to modify things. It's, it's not allowing people to share the tools that um, you need to modify television, so it's really only useful for people that know how to do that directly themselves. Uh, but still, it's great progress, and um, it's the kind of thing we need a lot more organizations doing. So the scary thing about these examples is that uh, they all have free software on them. Right? The Kindle, um, now I think uh, a lot of Kindles are Android-based, but um, back in 2009, that Kindle was actually running a version of GNU Linux. Amazon was publishing the source code for the components that they were using under the GPL. Uh, Vizio TVs, I don't, I'm assuming they run Android, but uh, if not, I'm, I know that they have other free software on them. Uh, the Tesla um, is using free software. So, you know, it's like, wait a second, the free software is supposed to enable us to be free from control, protect our privacy, uh, and avoid these kinds of things. So you know, the things that, that make this possible are that despite the fact that they use a lot of free software, key pieces of software on those devices are still proprietary. Right? The Amazon uh, book reading application is proprietary. Uh, the part that maintains the network connection to Amazon is proprietary. Um, they're also locked down. And even if you, for the software that you have, uh, access to the source code for. None of those devices allow you to make modifications and then put them back on the device. They have hardware checks so that when you attempt to do that, the device won't turn on, won't boot, um, because it detects that you're, you've modified the software. And so even though you have the source code, you in theory on paper have the permission to modify it and use your modified version, the actual hardware won't let you do it. And um, that's particularly the case with uh, cars, for example. So you know, Tesla uh, is locked down. You can't install modified versions of the battery software, um, even if it were free software. Uh, and then uh, the network connectivity, which is not strictly a free software issue. You can have a free software device that is always on the network. Um, but it's, I put it here because it's a, kind of an amplifier for these other two problems. You have a lockdown device that you don't have control over every piece of, um, and then it's connected to the network all the time. And that just gives the extra uh, turbo boost, the amount of um, control and, and violations of freedom that can happen. And it's not just your freedom. right? That's what I'm talking about um, users and their communities. Because this quickly becomes a kind of social uh, a pollution. It becomes a, something that even if you're using all free software yourself, um, you can be harmed by the fact that other people are still using proprietary software. And one example of this was the huge DDoS that happened in the fall of 2016. 
Uh, and that was traced back to things like uh, video cameras, uh, cable boxes, video recorders that people had in their houses. And these boxes had been uh, hijacked and used as part of a botnet to attack you know, various servers on the internet, brought down huge chunks of the internet for hours, uh, and caused a huge amount of economic damage, um, interrupted communications, political actions, everything that we do on the internet. And this again happens uh, because users did not have control over these devices. It's particularly in this space, it's very common for companies to make a device like this, sell it, and then never provide any updates or service after that. And um, so patching the devices in order to close the security holes that were used to launch the, the botnet attack was very challenging. It was a whole bunch of different manufacturers. A lot of them weren't supporting their devices anymore. They weren't going to help their users out. They weren't going to fix this problem. So then it falls on users themselves, or maybe third parties who might be able to provide fixes. Well, nobody else can, can provide fixes because the devices are locked down and you can't install modified versions of the software back on it, even for the large amount of the stack that on these types of devices that usually is free software. So uh, we were left powerless uh, to defend ourselves and it didn't matter if you had a fully free router and uh, I don't think there is a fully free cable box, but it didn't matter if any you know, of your devices were fully free, you were still suffering the pain of everybody else or other people uh, having vulnerable devices in their homes. And whenever we talk about this, and I think as free software advocates, it's really important to not overstate the security of free software. Okay, that's not the point here. Free software also has security vulnerabilities. Um, free software can actually be malicious. Um, that's just about the license. There's nothing stopping somebody from writing a program that, that uh, pretends to be a solitaire game but actually deletes your hard drive as soon as you run it. That could be free software. Um, but the thing is that as soon as someone detects, sees the source code and detects that that's what that software does, they are able to fix it and share a new version that doesn't do the bad things. And so it, over time, it is very unlikely that free software will be malicious because it's not, why would you, if you were being malicious, why would you just put all of the code that's malicious out for everybody to see? You would you know, go the way of a proprietary and uh, program without source. And when it comes to security, um, it's also, remember, security is always about security against somebody or something. And free software is the only kind of software that provides you with security against the uh, entity who gave you the software or the device to begin with. So Apple lately especially has been getting a lot of props for their security, way better than Android. Uh, it's uh, harder to break the encryption, you know, lots of uh, positive press for them. Well, th the problem with Apple was you don't have any security against Apple because you're not allowed to install any non-Apple software on your device. You're not allowed to uh, replace iOS with Android if you wanted to. Um, there's no other app store out there that you can switch to, so you have to trust Apple completely. And that's the kind of security that free software provides for you. You can always, if you don't like the person that's providing, the company that's providing you with software, um, you can switch to somebody else. And it's that kind of economy that enables you to actually have, over time, uh, full security. And it's also important to remember that free software can be used to do horrible things, right? Free software is used to do horrible things. Uh, free software is used to kill people. You know, with the military, free software is used by the NSA to spy on people. Um, just because you have control over the, just because you need to have control over the software um, in order to be free does not mean that everything that you might want to do with an object that has software on it should be legal, right? So we're going to fight for the freedom to modify software in cars. That doesn't mean we're going to oppose speed limits, right? Our point is that you can't regulate behavior through controls on the software itself. Uh, and so this isn't about uh, making sure that free software is only used for good things. It's making sure that free software is not used for, um, not used in context where what ends up happening is it's subverting its own goal. You know, things like uh, helping the Kindle run, helping the Tesla run, uh, helping the, the spying Vizio TVs run. That's what this talk is about, being concerned as to free software being used to subvert the goals of free software. Um, the fact that there's a whole bunch of other bad things you can do with free software is something that we need to address, uh, but it should be addressed through laws that regulate the behavior. Uh, a lot of you probably saw this joke going around. I've heard a lot of places, but uh, the S in IoT stands for security, related to the GDOS attack, and I just added my, uh, and the F stands for freedom. So. 
There's a bunch more examples of uh, bad behavior like this. We collect them on gnu.org slash proprietary. And uh, this is why, these examples are why we want things to be all free and not just mostly free. It's because anytime there is a, a piece of proprietary software on something, that piece is a, a foothold, you know, an attack surface that can be exploited, especially when it's in a situation like Amazon or Tesla, where the company who owns that software has the ability to update it and modify it over time. Because even if all the software was originally was a Wi-Fi driver, um, if that gives Amazon access to your device, they can install new kinds of proprietary software. They can make the proprietary software that's already there do different things. Uh, and so it's not enough when it comes to our freedom to have something that is mostly free software. And in fact, one of the points I'm trying to make here is that sometimes um, it can be worse for our freedom if we have uh, more of the software on a device be free. If what that software is being used for is actually to make distribution of a particularly particular proprietary software uh, quicker, more efficient, cheaper for the company that's distributing it. Uh, we know that companies respond to profit motive. Um, it's not the only thing that all companies respond to, but we know that it matters to them and, and that one way to get them to change their behavior is to make business cases to them to explain why doing something is better for their bottom line. Um, so if we think about these issues from that angle, uh, what can we do to encourage companies to, to do better, to have to uh, make and sell fully free devices, um, and how can we encourage people to support those companies and support those devices? Uh, so, you know, we have a, a strategy that we've been working on and, and, and following in order to uh, achieve that and the overall goal of having a fully free world. And um, it starts with teaching basic computer literacy. And this isn't teaching everybody to be a programmer. Um, not everybody needs to be a programmer. But I like to make an analogy to food and cooking. Um, when you go to a restaurant, you have a, an understanding of what's happening in the kitchen. You know how, that there's multiple people working together to prepare your food. You know that uh, if it's not done under the right kinds of conditions, like uh, the right temperature uh, in a clean environment, you know, things can happen that can make you sick. Um, you know that if you really like a dish at a restaurant, you can try to imitate it at home. You know that if you think something has, needs more salt, you can add salt to it. Um, so these are just basic facts about food, right? And they don't mean you're a chef. They don't mean you can actually cook anything. But you understand things about how your food is produced. And I think just this level of knowledge about computers and software would go a really long way to, helping, uh, be, to help us be able to explain to people why free software is important. Um, if, they were, if they understood that free software is made by, if they understood that all software, not just free software, all software is made by uh, usually groups of people working together, um, and that if they don't follow good practices, uh, bad things happen to them, then we could open that conversation about why they should support this kind of software development over that kind of software development, even if they have no intention to ever modify code themselves um, in their lives. And uh, I think also that people, we, we underrate the degree to which people do care about other people's freedom. Um, we, we face uh, some pushback sometimes where people say, like, you know, I just, I don't, I know what I'm giving up when I use uh, Photoshop or whatever piece of proprietary software. I'm fine with it. It's not a big deal to me. Uh, and we focus on that, that sort of uh, self-interested motivation and how do we convince people that free software is better for them. Well, that's a really hard, you know, that, that can be a really hard sell if someone doesn't have any intention to modify a program on their own. Why do I care if I have the source code? I can't read it. I'm not going to modify it. And so this is where we want to talk about both the, the way that software is produced, like the food analogy, but we also want to talk about just protecting the freedom of other people because there's lots of analogs to that, you know, around the world. We have freedom of the press. People care about freedom of the press even if they're not going to publish a newspaper themselves because they know that it's important for our society. It's important for providing accurate information so that people can make good decisions about who to vote for and who not to vote for and how to live their lives. Um, and so I think there's a window there with software as well. People can understand why, even if they're not going to modify programs themselves, uh, if we don't have the ability to modify programs, then we have TV spying on us, uh, cars changing behavior from day to day, um, and our books disappearing off the electronic shelves. But once we persuade people to care, we also have to enable them to actually act on it. 
we have to give them information about what software uh, is free and what software is not free. And then we need to meet that demand. We have to make sure that uh, when they do care about it and they do want free software and they can identify that software and the products that have that software, those products have to exist. Right? You have to be able to go to a store and buy them or order them online. And then we have to take this beyond just the product stage and grow the social movement um, because this is all about the, the, the social necessity of control over software and technology. The things you purchase are only one part of that. And then that ends also in uh, changing the laws. I'm going to talk about the importance of that uh, in a minute, too. So the third thing up there was uh, clear labels. How do you tell if something is free software? Well, this is the, the usual way to tell if something is free software. You look for a license notice. The GPL has a relatively friendly license notice. It's not too hard to read. It's not um, too legalistic, except for the all capital letters. But uh, it's, it's pretty plain language. It identifies that it's free software, and you have a certain set of rights. But you have to know where to look to find this. And it's not especially friendly. It's just, uh, it's just text. You have to actually open the box, get the disk out, or get the software downloaded from the company in order to, to see the notices that are in there. Um, we also have to worry about the fact that you know, some sites try to label which uh, software is free software and not free software so that you don't have to look for the license notices yourself. But download sites that uh, claim to give you free software are dangerous. It's, we don't really want to be encouraging people to go around and download everything that claims to be free software uh, because that's been exploited to do lots of bad things to people. So we have to give people a more trusted way to get software that uh, has been verified to be free as in freedom. And uh, even if you're an expert at this and you have all the source code, finding all the licenses notice, that all the relevant license notices in a piece of software can be challenging. And every day at the Free Software Foundation, we get reports of some program we thought was free. Uh, there's a question about it because someone found this license notice in this file that's three levels deep in the, the source uh, directory of the project. So this is not trivial. And the FSF provides uh, directory.fsf.org where we vet software and make sure the license notices are correct and that they're uh, free programs. And if they are, they can be listed in our directory. Um, and so that way, that's one way we're helping users out with this. Um, other program, other uh, repositories like FDroid uh, for Android also try to provide clear information about um, programs that are free. Unfortunately, lots of other popular places that distribute software do not, do, which distribute a mix of proprietary and free software, don't do a very good job of telling users what's free and what's not free. Uh, Google Play does not identify which programs are under a free license and which ones are proprietary. The Mozilla Extensions repository for your browser um, has very unclear license notices. Often for an extension, it'll say custom license, and that's the secret word for proprietary. Um, so overall, the situation is you know, kind of a mess. So what can we do for people to make this clearer? When it comes to purchasing things at the electronic store, uh, we can have labels on the outside of a box. This is an example of a label on a box from a router. This product may contain material licensed to you under the GNU General Public License or other open source software licenses. Upon request, open source software source code is available at cost from links this for at least three years from the product purchase date for detailed license terms and additional information. Look at linksys.com slash EPL. So that's, that tells you that it's got free software in there. It doesn't tell you that it's all free software. 10 minutes, OK. <laughs> You're like, you were telling me to stay still or something. Um, that doesn't tell you if it's all free software or, or what proprietary software is in there. Uh, and the other problem I have with this is, uh, and I, I don't want to criticize this too much, because it's good that they uh, put this notice on the box after we sued them, because they uh, had failed to do so. But to me, this label sounds a lot more like uh, this. Warning, some products sold in the store contain chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. Like this looks like, it's, that does not look like you know, something that you want. Um, so we want friendlier labeling. So uh, this is one example I look to. This is called the Leaping Bunny Program by Coalition for Consumer Information and Cosmetics. And this uh, label is something that you can put on your product if it is not tested on animals. Uh, and it's uh, relatively successful. It's on a lot of products. It's um, you know, a lot of shampoos, things like that. Next time you're in the store, take a look. You'll probably see a few of them. So what's the analog for this when it comes to software? You know, what, what can we do 
for electronic devices to indicate when they are all free software and respect user freedom and uphold these ideals. So this is what we came up with at the FSF. It's the Respect Your Freedom Certification Program. And our goal is uh, like the Leaping Bunny or like uh, on the darker side, the Windows Certified logo, uh, we, you can only display this mark if the product meets um, certain criteria. And this is a per product label. It's not for a company as a whole. Um, we, and it's not for a particular chipset that many companies might sell. It's to certify each product as sold by a particular company. And that'll become, uh, the reasons for that will be clear when we go over the criteria here in a second. There's a bunch of them. Uh, they are at fsf.org slash ryf. Um, and I just want to highlight a few of the key ones here. The most important one is the one that I've been repeating, and that's the 100% free software requirements. If you sell a router, if you sell a laptop, sell a Wi-Fi adapter, you can only have the mark if all of the software on the device is free software under a free license. Um, you also have to allow user installation of modified software, so it can't be locked down. Um, and so you know, the, the Kindle, the, the Tesla, they, they can't meet that criteria. Um, no spying or back doors. Uh, we don't do a full security audit on these devices before certifying them. We do uh, check for uh, some things that we know about, um, and that gets more thorough over time. But we have this rule in here because uh, if something comes to light that there's been a problem with a device, we can revoke the certification on the grounds of the security issue uh, because we do want these devices to not just be running free software, but also be things that um, are uh, don't harm users in, in other important ways. And this is, it's an advocacy program. So this is not just a hardware data, hardware compatibility database. It's, it's a certification we want to give to companies who are uh, acting in a way that we believe helps the free software movement and helps supply the kinds of products that we need in order to actually live uh, the free lives that we want to live. And so uh, we do have some rules about other endorsements being on the packaging because those other endorsements are often misleading. Uh, you'll see things on Mac products which say made for Mac. Well, they work just fine on GNU Linux, right? So uh, you can't have endorsements that are misleading like that that indicate that using it with proprietary software is better than using it with GNU Linux or a free operating system. So does anyone actually meet these criteria? Uh, yes. So 2012, our our first certified product was the Lulzbot 3D printer from Alif Objects. And uh, this was, we were really happy to certify this device, not just because it helped us get this whole program running, um, but because the 3D printer space is extremely uh, important. And the, on the eve of this certification, uh, MakerBot had announced a, uh, some new proprietary um, software, and it was also the same day that Intellectual Ventures received a patent on DRM for 3D printers. And you can imagine the consequences of that, that your 3D printer can print only objects that uh, Disney doesn't object to, right? We don't want DRM in 3D printers. So uh, it's exciting to have. There's since been more printers from ALF Objects certified. Uh, no printer that has DRM could meet the criteria. So this gives us a way to try to uh, leverage development of 3D printers that will actually respect their users' freedom. 2015, we had our first product with the uh, certification mark actually on the device. And that's the goal, you know, that uh, we want to have the certification mark both on the packaging so users can see it before they open it, and then also on the device itself, just like all the other certification marks that you can uh, see for a UAL and um, et cetera. So this is a Think Penguin uh, VPN router. Overall, we've had uh, 16, we've had Uh, those products certified 16 to technoethical, they have the most. Uh, 15 of those were awarded in 2006 or in 2017. Uh, ALF Objects has 10. Uh, Think Penguin, four. Uh, and then uh, three for Minifree, three for a company called Vikings, and one to Libiquity. And you can see it's an assortment of products here uh, laptops, uh, D16 mainboard, which can be used in workstations or servers, Wi Fi dongles, 3D printers, audio devices. So the program is wide open to anything that has uh, software on it, anything that you would want to use with a computer running software. And so we expect to certify many more um, kinds of devices and peripherals along these lines. Um, 
I'll go through a few examples here of why we think this program has a lot of potential. And, and uh, one thing that we hear from companies a lot is that people don't want to pay, they don't care. And so it's not worth the company's time to make a product that respects user freedom because it won't get them any more customers, it won't help their bottom line. Uh, we have some examples of how that's, uh, that demonstrate that there clearly is a market for uh, devices that respect user's freedom. The Purism laptop uh, does not actually meet the criteria. But I put it up here because the way that they marketed the laptop was heavily focused on uh, respecting your rights. And that's what they distinguished themselves on. And even though they didn't do that according to the criteria that we have laid out, that was the message. And people responded to that message. And they raised uh, 431000 you know, almost twice what their original crowdfunding goal was. They also recently crowdfunded a phone. Well, that raised two point, almost $2.3 million to produce a phone that respects uh, user freedom and is a secure device. And this one, uh, they are working with us to try to meet the respects for freedom criteria. Um, and we're optimistic based on uh, what they've said so far that that can be possible. And that evaluation will happen when the device is actually produced, which I think is in one to two years still, it takes a while. Um, but you know, just people put up $2.3 million to get a device that would run all free software. So the demand is out there. The Novena was another, uh, device that was marketed as being you know, totally hackable, running all free software, that raised $783,000, way over their goal. So people do want these devices. Um, and also, every time a company says nobody demands this kind of thing, uh, think about the fact that there's no information there about we, if we have no label, in what way can any customer, any consumer demonstrate their preference for products that have free software on them? It's like saying that nobody wants healthy food when there's no nutrition labels on food. Right? If you don't have the information, you can't express a preference for it. And so we're in a bit of a chicken or egg situation, and we're hoping that this mark, the certification mark, will help uh, demonstrate you know, the start of a market, and then we'll be able to, to build on that. Um, these high standards also really help drive software development. So the Libreroot project was a project to replace the proprietary BIOS on, uh, is a, a project to replace the proprietary BIOS on, a, on everything, on laptops, on mainboards. And it was originally started in order to meet the RYF criteria for a laptop. Uh, sometimes people think our standards are too high, or we're asking too much, or we should give levels, you know, four stars, three stars, five stars. Uh, and you know, we, are all, we are always thinking about those things. But examples like this show that when you keep the standards high, uh, people do things to meet them. And so you don't want to have the standards set to such a degree that you don't have a low enough that you don't have the incentive to meet to uh, drive development as much as you would if the standards were higher. We need lots of more devices. Um, we want to try to certify at least one kind of every device that people typically want to have. Uh, but there's new kinds of devices coming out all the time, virtual reality, wearables, medical technology. We definitely have our work cut out for us. We have a lot of barriers to overcome. Um, the two I want to highlight are basically the general lack of driver support on mobile devices for things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and graphics, and secret software buried deep in computers like the Intel Management Engine, which is an every ThinkPad uh, made since 2007. The program is doing really well. Um, the sad thing is we are the bottleneck. The FSF has more applications to review than we have time to review. Uh, we really need more support in order to be able to work through those. We're really aiming to scale the program up this year, and that's going to take resources. Um, we are a member-driven organization. People, we depend on individual donations. Uh, if you can help, please do. This is the type of work that your donation will fund. Uh, and I also hope you'll buy and use these devices. Sometimes they cost a little more, but it's worth it to support companies that are trying to do the right thing. Um, sorry I uh, ran out of time at the end there, but I am around, like I said, until Saturday, until Friday to talk about things. So if you have questions or ideas, feel free to grab me. Thank you very much.